Good morning, everybody. So many, many years ago, I was actually where you are now. I was smart, I was ambitious, I wanted to change the world, but I really didn't know how I was going to do it. And I was a math geek. So I went up here for college, to King's College, Cambridge. And I studied mathematics in the Department of Applied Mathematics and Theoretical Physics. This is where Newton studied, where Dirac studied, where Stephen Hawking studied and taught. And as I graduated, I knew a lot about black holes and I'd studied quantum field theory, but I found that I actually had no employable skills. When I went out to get a job, which I needed, as I assume you will too, I found that while I didn't have any directly applicable skills, I actually had something that the employers wanted. I had been trained in structured logic and structured thinking and problem solving. And so my very first job was with TI and they taught me how to write code. They taught me how to write software. And it's because of the software that they taught me that I have the career that I have today. So what I want to talk with you about is actually about software. So let's start with your day. The average teenager in America spends six hours a day texting, maybe one and a half, two hours a day on Facebook and Tumblr, and three hours plus watching television, and watching it on a laptop or an iPad or a phone, not necessarily on a television. So for more than 10 hours a day, you are interfacing into software, whether or not you know it. You have software on your phone, it's in your car, it's on your computer, it's even in, in place when you're going to the movies. The Avengers was a terrific movie. I'm sure you've may, most of you have seen it. But the Avengers itself had 2,200 special effects in it, all driven by software, created by artists, but driven by software. I'm CEO of a technology company, and my day actually isn't very different from yours. I interface the software, I estimate, more than 50% of the time. I'm using the office applications like you do, PowerPoint, Excel, and Word. I'm using some business applications like Salesforce.com. I'm on my phone. I'm using LinkedIn, Twitter, Dropbox. And I'm using, even using my personal favorite time waster, Words with Friends. <laughs> so we're at the beginning of a revolution the revolution that started with the invention of the computer 60 years ago, then the microprocessor 40 years ago, then software, then the internet, and then the great leveler, which is the smart cell phone. It's going to change every aspect of human lives over the next several hundred years. But as a species, we've actually seen a revolution like this before. In 1440, there was a revolution that was the democratization of knowledge. And it happened because of the invention of the printing press by Johannes Gutenberg. Within 50 years of the invention of the printing press, there were 35,000 book titles in print. There were more than 20 million books in existence. And for the first time in history, if you could write, you could change the world. Now this came after a long period of knowledge only being controlled by the elite. Socrates was writing about philosophy. Julius Caesar was sending propaganda back from his battlefield. The Roman Catholic Church was controlling what we, what we thought and what we knew in Europe. But with the invention of the printing press, all that changed. And if you could write, you could actually influence the whole world around you. So the revolution that we're about to see, or we're right at the beginning of, is actually the democratization of influence, the democratization of what people do every day and how they are influenced, that it is as profound as the invention of the printing press. It's affecting everybody on the planet. There are 6.8 million people, billion people on Earth, and 5 billion of them have cell phones. That's more than have access to clean water or own a toothbrush or own a toilet. Of the, think about it, of the one billion people in India, 40% of them actually can't read and write, but the majority of, the, uh, majority of them have access to a cell phone. It's revolutionizing the way they live. And software is making a huge difference. Think about the invention of voice recognition software. 
people in India are, are on software all the time, whether they're texting or they're Facebooking on a smartphone or they're running a micro business on their cell phone. And with voice recognition, they don't even have to be able to read and write to do that. So it's a massive revolution that is going to change the planet dramatically over the next 500 years. But it's affecting everybody. It's affecting you. And I don't mean just you in the general sense. I mean you sitting here right, right now today. And I'll give you a, a kind of fun, silly example. So let's say you're hungry for a donut. You want a donut. And several years ago, the way you would go about buying a donut is you would probably go to a local donut store that you knew where you liked the donuts and maybe the guy or gal behind the counter was cute because you're teenagers or they liked you. Today, you are much more likely to open an application, check out where your friends are, figure out where they're going or perhaps open a coupon application and figure out where you can get a coupon to get a discounted donut. And that's where you'll go buy the donut. Software is controlling and influencing you in ways that you may not be aware of when you do that. And it's doing it in two ways. The first way is that software is dramatically influencing the choice that you're making. It's filtering in and filtering out the inputs to your decision. It's deciding what you see when you're tr trying to make a decision about where you're going to go. The second thing the software app that you're, do, you're using is doing is it's storing every single thing about you. It's storing where you are. It's storing what you like. It's storing what you bought. It's storing who you bought it with and what message you sent to your friends as you bought and ate your donut. And it's storing that information forever. It's not just storing it for the short period of time. And then, if that app is free, it is selling that information. It's selling every minutia of your activity so that it can influence you and it can sell you as a product. So if the application is free, you need to remember that you are not the customer. You yourself are the product. That's not all negative. Think about the role software played in the Arab Spring just last year the access to real-time social communication software was one of the things that made the Arab Spring possible. And the people who, who wrote the applications that the protesters used, in some small way, participated in that revolution. Coding was a key part of that revolution. Software is so pervasive now that that's why I believe it's as important now to be able to code so that you can participate in that, this revolution as it is to be able to read and write. It's, it's going to change everything about what we do, and yet it isn't as popular as it used to be. The interest in technology has been declining. It's been declining over the last 20 years in that 20 years ago, high school, top tier high school students were 29% likely to pick a STEM education. That's science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Today, only 14% of the top tier students are likely to do that. Now, what do I mean by coding? Do I mean that everybody has to be able to write C++ or JavaScript or Ruby on Rails? Maybe, many of you probably do, maybe not. But what I do mean is that everybody needs to understand how to do structured logic and how to create structured logic so that you can drive one of the many applications of which there are now hundreds through which you can create software. Everybody needs to be able to participate. So let me do a mini survey here. How many of you can write code? Hands up. Mm, okay, 25, 30% of you. So we're in Palo Alto, California, the hottest Silicon Valley. I actually thought I'd find more of you here that could write code. It's a problem that more people aren't writing code. The number of girls who go into computer science now has been dropping since the 1970s. We have less than one in five students are women who graduate with a major in computer science. And yet there's absolutely no reason for that. Any child can learn how to read and write and 
any child can learn structured logic and learn how to write code. Anybody can do it. And if you want to participate in this revolution, whether you learn now or you learn 10 years from now, you're going to want to know how to write code. But rather than you know, the grand sweep of history and things like the Arab Spring, let me give you three really pragmatic reasons why it's really important. The first is I talked about influence, the need to be a part of this change that's happening. The internet and the data that's being collected about you in software is as pervasive around you as electricity is. In fact, in many developing countries, it's easier to get access to the internet than it is to get access to electricity. For PG&E to run power into your house, they actually have to run a physical cable into your house. For you to get access to the internet, there just has to be a cell tower or a wireless hub somewhere in your vicinity. The data is all around you all the time. It's more pervasive than roads or electricity or words. So the question is, in this revolution that's happening, do you want to be driven or do you want to drive? Now, this is a high school, so I'm willing to if you either have keys in your pocket, car keys in your pocket, or you really wish you had car keys in your pocket. Never mind how many bicycles are out in the parking lot. But think about what happened after the printing press and the role that people who could read and write were able to play, the influence that they were able to have on the thought around them. And think about how you interface into software every single day for more than 10 hours a day and if you want to have that kind of influence, then you want to be driving and not be being driven. The second reason is a very practical one of finding a job as you come out of college. If you graduate with a degree in science, technology, engineering, or math, you will make 30% more money coming out of college than if you don't. By 2016, which is right before many of you will be graduating, because you're probably the graduating classes of 2017, 2018. By 2016, the US will actually be graduating less than 50% of the engineers that we need to fill the jobs that we have to keep up. In technology, we have a dramatic need for more people. We have a dramatic need for, for students coming out of college who are trained in technology, trained in computer science, trained in structured thought, to help us fill the jobs that we have. Now, I went down to Occupy Wall Street in New York at the height of the protests, and I walked around asking the young people that I saw, what are you, what are you, why are you here, what are you doing, what's your background? And while my survey is by no means scientific, I didn't meet a single engineer. I didn't meet a single person with a technical major or minor. And we need diversity in technology. So this is for everybody. This isn't just about white men and programmers, the way that the media would have you believe. This is actually about everybody participating. Because in technology, diversity gives you better results. When you have a team that is made up of people who are cognitively different, different gender, different race, different national origin, different sexual orientation. They actually come at problem solving differently. They don't agree. They have a different starting point and they create something called creative abrasion. And that creative abrasion is what creates greater innovation. This has been proven in many studies now. You get a diverse team, you get a better result. So when it comes to employment, I would encourage every single one of you to look as you go into college at majoring or minoring in a STEM subject so you can be part of this revolution. And then the third reason is a really personal one. So I learned to write code when I was 21 years old coming right out of college. And I have had more fun in software than I ever would have imagined possible. I had a great time in high school. I had a fantastic time of college, what I remember of it. <laughs> but since then, since I learned how to get involved in software, it's, been, it's exceeded my wildest expectations. Because I'm involved in technology and software, I've been a CEO twice. I've taken my company public. I've created lots of jobs. I've created wealth 
for my employees. My teams have created amazing products that change the world. I've traveled all over the world and I've still had a family. I have two math nerds at home. And software is what's made all of this possible. The understanding of software is what made it, has made it possible. So this revolution is happening. It's about 60 years in. It is changing every single aspect of our lives. And it's probably a 500-year social change that we're going to see. And I'm able to participate and lead and influence business decisions because I'm literate in the language of the revolution because I'm literate in the language of software and structured thinking and logic. I can play a material role, and I can in some tiny way influence the world and make it better. And so I really encourage you to get involved, and I can also tell you it is incredible fun. Thank you.